today with Debbie Reynolds from Imer Stahl, and we're going to be talking today about the recent news involving the Capital One data breach. Um, thank, thank you for being on the show, Debbie. Thank you for inviting me. It's such a thrill. It's such a joy to to be around and talk to. So it's great to do this session with you. Well, it's great to have you here. So. Uh, Trials expected this Thursday in the case. Can you tell everyone a little bit about what happened this week? So, um, uh, this week is in the news that uh, Capital One had a data breach. Uh, there was a, a woman who used to be, I believe, she's worked at Amazon, if I'm not mistaken, uh, who had found a vulnerability in Capital One's cloud system and was able to obtain. Um, uh, private or digital information on over 100 million customers or potential customers of Capital One. So as far as I can tell, they say that uh, she may have gathered uh, uh, social, social security numbers and other private information about individuals who had even applied, who may not even be customers of Capital One, but who had even applied for Capital One credit cards back as far as 2005. Yeah. Uh, so the ex the uh, vulnerability that was discovered, um, and, and part of the reason why it was discovered is because she had apparently bragged about it on Twitter. She used her real name, and uh, so so they were able to sort of pull this stuff together. And I think the SWAT team like went to her house. Or yeah. Something. So she was using IP I Predator, which is supposed to anonymize and protect you. So she when she was using that, she created her online. GitHub accounts and other accounts, and it had that IP, the iPredator IP address range right. in her profile linked to her name, so yeah. she wasn't really being smart no. about her covert address. <laughs> so, so yeah, I think that she was she was bragging about what she had. I guess she was proud of what she had done, and apparently, someone who had seen something she had posted on some forum contacted Capital One. So. This wasn't a, a breach in which Capital One found out about. Uh, someone from the outside said, hey, this girl says that she has her data, and that was sort of a really big thing. Yeah, so, so now she's charged with the Computer uh, Fraud and Abuse Act, which um, I think she'll probably end up yeah. negotiating the plea. Ah, she's probably going to go with Slammer. It seems like, especially when the SWAT team showed up at her house, <laughs> they're definitely going to make an example out of her uh, with this. Uh, it's pretty bad because I think right now the, the reports and what's coming out from Capital One are different than what she said or what other people said that they have. Because at one point they were saying uh, Capital One in their statement said that certain people's social security numbers weren't breached, but then we know that they did get people's social security numbers. Yeah, it, was mostly, it was mostly Canadian uh, social security numbers, around a million. Right. And then I think it was somewhere around 100,000 or so. Uh, U.S. citizens. Right, exactly. So it exactly. doesn't necessarily impact the entirety no. of U.S. customers, but it, it still is. It does, and it doesn't make you feel good. Yeah, yeah. So, right. So basically, over a, a hundred million people were touched in some way, shape, or form, even though not everyone's personal data was taken to the same extent as everyone else. But I think this this incident um, illustrates a, a couple of different things. Uh, first of all, they were saying they had credit card. Uh, information or information on people who have applied for credit cards this is going back as far as 2005. I'm not sure if you know they can make a justification for why they even had some of that stuff in the first point. place. Um, especially if, if, and I wonder what rights someone would have if they weren't actually didn't translate to be being a customer mm -hmm. of Capital One. So the law is kind of murky about how they should do that. I guess that's the same issue with Equifax, mm -hmm. where not everyone who was touched by Equifax are customers by Equifax. They just happen to have their data. And so, what would, how would you have advised Capital One had you gotten in there before the data breach? <laughs> you think you would, might have been able to? Well, you get know, them in a better situation. I think I think a lot of corporations. You know, my my view is that a lot of corporations have this mindset or business has this mindset of does it work? You know, does the computer work? Can I do the thing I need to do on a computer? The question that they're not asking is, is it secure? So a lot of them have a blind spot in terms of securing things because as long as it doesn't impact the, their ability to work, you know, they don't really care how it works. 
So now companies have asked, how does it work? Is it secure? Um, a lot of companies have these issues where they're moving from internal infrastructure to the cloud, and we know that the cloud infrastructure would typically be more secure, quote unquote, than someone's on-premise infrastructure, but that all depends on how it's configured. So the vulnerability that this woman was able to exploit in Capital One had to do with how the, the permissions and things were configured on the cloud uh, infrastructure. She had worked in that environment. Right. She, she had worked in that yeah. extra insight. Exactly. In this exactly. But I, you know, I don't know if you you probably get running into the same thing where you're having clients that have cloud issues and they may feel more secure, you know, in themselves. So, okay, we we'll, we think our data is more safe in the cloud. Not to say that the cloud is not safe, but if you have someone who doesn't know how to to fill those gaps and stop those vulnerabilities, it could be a huge problem. Yeah. So what do you think of the, the CEO's response from Capital One? I saw a CEO's response. Um, I don't know, someone needs to do a series about this where you compare all the response letters to these data <laughs> breaches or whatever. That's a good idea. Not a bad response at all. Um, I think the, the danger though is, uh, you know, there may be an issue with consumer confidence, obviously, because yeah. no one wants their data breached. But, if the things that are being said by the CEO or other leadership is it becomes evident that it's different than what actually happened, that's going to be a problem. So I think rushing, you know, the the desire is to rush to put out as much information as you possibly can, but already the news reports are contradicting what the company is saying about what was actually breached. Yeah, well, the complaint is available. I'll post that up my website as well. Okay. I read the complaint and there's a lot of detail in there and you're right, it, in the news story you're talking about Amazon Cloud, they talk about a company that presumably is a subsidiary right. of Amazon inside the complaint. Right. They didn't specifically mention Amazon in the complaint. No, no. So it's going to be, you know, customers when they when they feel like they've had a data breach, they definitely want, they, you know, there's a, a tension that has to happen where the company wants to be as forthright and forthcoming as possible about what's happened, but the facts may still be rolling out. Um, yeah. You know, the, the drip, drip, drip of it all may be tough, yeah. I think. But I thought at least it was good that they public acknowledged that it didn't take forever oh, to right. acknowledge exactly. it. Oh, right, exactly. And apologize. I mean, oh, that goes a, a long way. It does the, go a long way. They just did that, so I applaud them for oh, for not sitting on the back with facts. Or right, or <laughs> they didn't say they didn't say, "Well, I'm sorry that you were, you know, you felt hurt yeah. or something." It's like, oh yeah, you know, there there is harm there, so yeah. you might as well acknowledge it and try to at least be forthright about what you know and when you know it. Yeah, and, and from what I read too, um, not all the data. Some of the data was tokenized, but there were birth dates, there were some socials, right. and some other information. Right. Certainly, if that were you or me, well, we're kind of becoming used to this all yeah. the time. It's sad. But. Right. Well, I mean, and, and what we're seeing, uh, what I'm seeing, uh, what companies are trying to argue in the U.S. having to do with data privacy is, um, you know, if you put, let's say you're on Facebook and you say, hey, today's my birthday. You know, so if Lee puts his birthday on Facebook, it's Lee's birthday private. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're a Capital One customer, they can argue, you know, your birthday is not private because you put it on Facebook. Yeah. So well, that's going to be an interesting thing. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for being on the show today. Oh, I really fantastic. appreciate it. Thank you.